All right, thank you. Uh, welcome. It's great to see so many people in your space. Uh, I'm Jamie. I'm an engineering manager at Monzo, um, but I'm not going to talk about Monzo today. Uh, so I've been building mobile apps since around 2009, um, and I've become kind of fascinated with things that just feel like they are unsolved problems that just won't go away in mobile engineering. Uh, and so today I'm going to talk about one of those, and that is code duplication. So don't repeat yourself is this foundational principle in software development. Uh, so we avoid duplicating code whenever possible because it's inefficient and it just makes extra room for bugs and inconsistencies to creep into our code bases. <clears throat> but if we look at the most widely distributed apps in the world, the ones that are on the phones in our pockets, they've mostly been written twice. So there are two Monzo apps, there's two Spotify apps, two Netflix apps, and so on. And the companies that are shipping na native mobile applications are spending thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours solving the same problems on Android and on iOS. And they're really rarely achieving full parity in the user experience. And so to understand how we got here, I want to dive into our workflows for writing, compiling, and executing code. And so let's go right back and start with native code. What is native code? So when I was in high school, I got my hands on this book. It's Sam's Teach Yourself C for Linux Programming in 21 Days. And if anyone has ever gotten one of these books, it takes much longer than 21 days to get through them. <laughs> but there's something behind this like really very oddly specific title. And that is that when you write a program in C, you need to compile it for a specific CPU architecture and operating system. So in this example, we're compiling C for Linux with an x86 CPU. And if you want that program to run on multiple different platforms, you're going to need to compile multiple different binary builds. And you may also need to adapt code that deals with operating system specific features like file systems or UI toolkits. And this is essentially how iOS apps are built. There is a different build target for each iPhone CPU architecture. And it works really well for iOS because it's a vertically integrated platform. It has a really small set of devices to support. But if you want to build and distribute code that runs on a really wide range of hardware, it gets really complicated. And so in 1996, Sun Microsystems released this thing called the Java Virtual Machine, hoping to solve that problem. And so with the JVM, you write code in a language like Java, but you compile it to an intermediate bytecode format. So you just compile it once, and then you can run that same package on any device that has a JVM. And that could be a desktop computer, a server, a smart fridge. Um, I was trying to find the most ludicrous example of a device that runs the JVM, and that is the Mars Spirit Rover. Um, so uh, this code portability made the JVM <laughs> extremely popular. Um, and it's got this really large developer community. It's got a huge ecosystem of open source libraries because of this portability. Um, and JVM source languages like Java, Kotlin, and Scala have also become really popular in backend development. We also know that Android's Dolvik and Art runtimes are fair use implementations uh, of the JVM. Uh, powering the apps on about 3 million mobile devices. 3 billion, sorry. And so we talked about how we compile native code and about virtual machines. But the word native means something subtly different when we're talking about mobile apps. So native mobile apps are apps that are built with the standard platform tool chains and UI toolkits. So Android apps built in Kotlin, compiled to bytecode, or iOS apps developed in Swift, compiled to binaries that run on iPhones. And so you can see these two parallel tracks where iOS and Android use different languages, and they use completely different compilation strategies. And there's really very little scope to share code between the two platforms with the standard development tools. And this is part of the reason that we ended up with mobile duopoly in the first place, because nobody wanted to write their app a third time for a contender like Windows Phone. And if you're Apple or Google, this is a pretty convenient situation. You're not very motivated to fix it. OK, so that, that's not exactly true. There is a way to, to share code by default. 
um, it has always been possible to interact with uh, native C or C++ code using the Android NDK, uh, or on iOS, you can just create Objective-C wrappers. And this is a really popular approach for porting games. Um, it's also something that works particularly well when you have a very narrow interface to some performance critical code. Um, so for example, uh, in 2014, I worked at a music streaming service called SoundCloud. Um, and we needed to optimize the time to play performance of our player. We needed to support all of these next generation audio codecs that had much lower bandwidth. And we also just find ourselves working around a lot of bugs in the native media player implementations on Android and iOS. So we decided this was such a core part of our user experience that we would invest in building our own playback stack in C, which was shared between our Android and iOS apps. And for this use case, it worked really well. However, very few companies have adopted C or C++ as a general purpose approach for sharing code between mobile applications. And that's because these lower level languages are just not a very good fit for the challenges of the mobile domain. So that's things like handling streams of asynchronous events, uh, calling web services, building responsive user interfaces, integrating with the platform APIs. All of that is really difficult from native C or C++ code inside your apps. And so the developer experience friction of doing pointer arithmetic and manual memory management has just always slightly outweighed the cost of duplicating code in higher level languages like Kotlin and Swift. And so cross-platform frameworks emerged to challenge the status quo and to fill this gap. So Facebook released React Native in 2015. Google followed a couple of years later with Flutter in 2017. And there were several cross-platform frameworks that came before, um, but these are really the options that seem to have taken off. Uh, they're particularly successful for small startup businesses that just can't invest in large mobile teams where you need pairs of native mobile app developers. And so by the way, we're about to talk about React Native. I'm going to point out that the word native in React Native is talking about platform UI toolkits. So it's not native code, um, and it's not a native app, but it does render native widgets. And I promise this is the third and final meaning of the word native in this talk. <laughs> So React Native, um, you write code in JavaScript. Um, it's bundled up with a runtime. And then on the device, uh, it's interpreted with a JavaScript engine to render native layouts. Um, these frameworks seek to abstract away the underlying platform. Um, so you write your app one time in a third language, like JavaScript or Dart. And then you can generate builds for Android and iOS. And there are some downsides to being further abstracted from the platforms. So you may have to wait for new features to become available in the frameworks, for example. And whether that's a deal breaker will really depend on what you're building. So JavaScript interpreters are the only code execution environments allowed by Apple on iOS. And that means that something like a JVM or any sort of virtual machine is kind of impossible here. And all cross-platform options are ultimately doing one of two things. They're either um, compiling to native code or they're bundling up some JavaScript inside of an app. And so Flutter is an example of the other approach. Uh, with Flutter, you write code in Dart. It's compiled to native. Um, and what Flutter are doing is actually completely re-implementing the UI toolkit. So they produce widgets that look like an Android button or an iOS button, um, but it's actually essentially drawing to its own canvas. And these days, the apps that are built with these frameworks are, are often better than good enough. You've probably used one without knowing that it was built with one of these frameworks. But relatively few large flagship mobile products have migrated. So why aren't teams taking advantage of these technologies when they tackle such a universal challenge in mobile engineering? And part of that reason is that cross-platform frameworks tend to optimize for building brand new apps. So sharing the full stack from UI to networking code, or at least full experiences within an app. So in the Facebook app, for example, there are certain screens that are built with React Native, but it is primarily a native app. And so Amazon talk about decision-making in terms of one-way doors and two-way doors. 
A two-way door decision is a decision that you can make really quickly because it's very easy to reverse. But adopting a cross-platform framework, because you may have to re-implement an entire experience within your app, looks more like a one-way door. If that doesn't work out for you and your team for whatever reason, it's been a pretty expensive mistake. But even for brand new products that are starting from scratch, investing in a cross-platform technology involves a lot of really big non-technical decisions. You need to think about how easily you're going to be able to hire engineers that are excited about working in Dart. Or you need to accept the risk of Meta withdrawing its sponsorship for React Native. And so I'm going to take a step back for just a second. To me, the theme of the last decade or so of mobile engineering has been convergence. So in the early days, nobody was really thinking very much about sharing code. Um, as an Android specialist, I found the iOS ecosystem completely alien. It was very different tooling. The languages looked very different. Um, and the whole discipline of mobile engineering was extremely specialized and honestly, so underdeveloped that we just couldn't realize how much we had in common. But today, if we look at these two platforms, they're remarkably similar. iOS and Android engineers have in tandem adopted things like reactive patterns, unidirectional data flows, MVVM architecture, declarative UIs, and a whole host of other practices. So the code that we're writing today in Kotlin and in Swift is really more duplicative than it has ever been. And so when you're writing modularized platform agnostic business logic, you're almost like keystroke for keystroke duplicating thought and effort. And so Kotlin multi-platform may be a ray of light. It is the new kid on the block, uh, having reached beta in 2022. However, it is already being used in production apps some pretty big apps with tens of millions of users. And it presents a really fundamentally different model for code sharing than what we've talked about so far. It enables you to share things like business logic, databases, or networking layers, but without locking you into any specific patterns or UI toolkits. And so code that is written with Kotlin Modi platform, it's Kotlin code, but it's compiled to target different platforms with different compiler backends. So you can produce an iOS framework uh, compiled with Kotlin native and separately produce JVM bytecode that will run on Android. And JetBrains pitch Kotlin Modi platform or Kotlin Modi platform mobile as a way to share the logic of your iOS and Android apps while keeping the UX native. I think there are some other attributes that make it super interesting. So because it's Kotlin, it's a language that is familiar to basically all native mobile app developers. Kotlin and Swift are extremely similar languages. It allows you to incrementally adopt the framework. The minimum use case for, for Kotlin multi-platform is just a single function. You have access to platform APIs from any layer of your application. You get native performance. And you also have the option to build for additional targets, like JavaScript or WebAssembly, if you have some code that would make sense to also share with your web app. And so instead of putting distance between the developer and the platform, this framework gives you some flexibility. You can build native mobile UIs with tools like Jetpack Compose or Swift UI and just share code wherever it makes sense for you and for your team. And you can see on this slide that when you do share code, you can still use platform features via a mechanism called expect actual. So the shared code here has three separate source sets. And most of the platform agnostic code that you write will live in this middle common main source set. But there are two other source sets, one for iOS main and one for Android main. And here you can put code that has access to the APIs of those platforms. So let's see how that looks in, in practice. Um, here's a class called user state. It is an expect class, which means that we expect to have actual implementations for each platform. 
And in this case, we have a user ID field. And say that we want to persist that field. Um, what would be a good way to persist a string on Android? Anyone? Shared preferences. Shared preferences. Okay, so here is the actual implementation of that class inside our Android main source set. Um, so this takes a context, which you need to initialize shared preferences, and then it just persists that string ID. And so we're going to have to implement this for iOS as well, because this is using platform code. Uh, and does anyone know what the iOS equivalent of shared preferences is? User defaults. User defaults. So this is essentially the exact same thing, but this is in our iOS main source set. Uh, and we're persisting that same field using NS user defaults. Uh, so notice here that we are interacting with the APIs of the iOS platform from Kotlin code. And so I'm going to describe two different ways of using Kotlin Modi platform. And the first is just to share some specific business logic. Um, so teams that already maintain large Android and iOS applications can go multi-platform extremely incrementally. So the simplest way to begin is just by sharing a single module of business logic um, that could be even just a handful of utility functions. And you can package that up as an iOS framework um, that you can distribute with CocoaPods or a Swift Package Manager. And for, from Android, um, you would just package that up like any other dependency consume it via Gradle. And so for a concrete example, um, at my last company, Memrise, um, we were building a language learning application. And we had this core game loop logic that um, had to work offline. Um, and it also dealt with things like how many points you would get for getting a right answer. Um, so we needed the logic to be exactly consistent across all of our applications. And so we built a library um, in a separate repository that would just handle all of this core game logic. Um, and that was uh, a library that had its own build process. It produced versioned artifacts. And those artifacts were consumed by our Android iOS and our web app in JavaScript. And there are some potentially more interesting and challenging places to start. That could be sharing an API layer or sharing analytics models, or even things like creating a new SQLite data store are quite well supported. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, you can build thin native UI layers for Android and for iOS and share as much code as possible in a mobile monorepo. And this is where Kotlin Modi platform is competing more directly with these traditional cross-platform frameworks just that you build your UI layer separately for each platform. And so on this slide, I used this method to develop a really simple app to track my running. It just connects with the Strava API. And I found that even though I was duplicating a lot of code, I, I duplicated the UI uh, layouts, the view models. It's all native navigation logic. Um, even with that, I was able to immediately share more than half of the code of the application that handled things like API requests, persistence, and data models. And I also find that the more that I work on this project, the more that the balance shifts towards shared code. And here's what that looks like in a little bit more detail. So on the left here, uh, you write your shared code in Kotlin. Um, and as we just talked about with Expect Actual, you can just consume Android and iOS APIs directly from your shared code. Um, the Kotlin shared code can be multiple modules, although for iOS, that is always going to be wrapped up inside a single framework. And then this artifact is consumed by uh, a thin UI layer written natively for iOS and for Android using Swift and using Kotlin. You can even share things like view models if your aim is to absolutely maximize code sharing. Um, there are pros and cons. And so you can probably tell that I think this is a really promising technology, but I want to add some balance and say that this does have some limitations. It is still in beta. The IDE support is, in some places, still quite rough. Um, 
the interop with Objective C um, is maybe a bit unfamiliar because most iOS engineers are now using Swift. Um, the expect actual classes, they only have access to Objective C headers of the iOS uh, platform. And this set of things, these are kind of solvable problems. I think eventually these will get better and they will go away. But there are also some immutable characteristics of this approach um, that you will need to get used to. So as Android developers, there are some things that you will expect to work that will not work. A lot of libraries depend on functionality within the JVM and will not be compatible. So you may not be able to, for example, use retrofit or room, but there are equivalents like KTAR and SQL Delight. And another thing that you don't have when you're not using the JVM is reflection. So things like mocking frameworks that you might be really used to using as part of your testing process on Android um, are simply not supported when you're compiling for Kotlin native. Um, and you may need to create a lot of interfaces and write a lot of manual mocks. Um, you may also just need to use the expect actual mechanism more than you expect because there's a lot of things like string.format I thought, thought for sure is just a feature of the Kotlin language, but of course it uses a JVM implementation and thankfully there is an exact equivalent for iOS. And so I think Android engineers are in this really good position to evaluate Kotlin Modi platform. It's a language that's already familiar. It's a lot of the same tooling. But I think it's really critical that you bring iOS engineers on this journey, find an iOS champion for Kotlin Modi platform integration, because they will be really important for finding the best way to distribute and integrate the native code, the shared code, sorry. <laughs> um, and more broadly, I think the mobile platforms will continue to converge. And there is a case for us to start thinking more as mobile engineers and less as platform specialists. So sharing code and collaborating across the Android and iOS boundary just reduces waste. And the teams that make the right trade-offs here are going to move faster. So whatever approach makes sense for you, if there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's to look for those opportunities to share more code. Thank you.